Being a great communicator means that you understand that the goal of a conversation is to understand what you are saying and to help you understand me. And that if we walk away from a conversation still disagreeing with each other, still thinking each other is wrong or an idiot, but if I understand what you are trying to tell me and I spoke in such a way that you can understand me, then that conversation has been a success. I'm beyond excited to be joined by Charles Duhigg, Pulitzer Prize winning journalist and author of The Power of Habit, a book that made a huge impression on me. He's recently released his new book, Super Communicators. In it, Charles breaks down what sets apart those rare people who seem to have a magic touch when it comes to conversations and connections, and how the rest of us can tap into those same skills. And that is the best part. These skills aren't just for born leaders or gifted orators. They're techniques that anyone can learn and apply. Whether you're pitching investors, rallying your team, or simply trying to build stronger relationships in your personal life. So, if you've ever struggled to get your point across, to inspire others to action, or to build the kind of relationships that fuel success, this episode is for you. Grab a pen, get ready to take notes. By the end of this conversation, you'll have a clear idea for becoming a super communicator in your own right and unlocking the full potential of your ideas, your team, and your vision. Okay, my conversation with Charles Duhigg. Um, so Charles, I came across your work maybe seven, eight, nine years ago. I'm trying to remember exactly when, but um, to me, you are the famous habits guy. <laughs> and so I came across the power of habit uh, a long time before. Uh, I think even Atomic Habits was probably an idea yeah. in James Clear's head. Um, not that things are a competition, of course, but I, because I really appreciate and like writing that is journalistic and scientific and has lots of, uh, lots of information that's been well-researched and all of the things, I really loved The Power of Habit and it really oh, helped me, uh, in my journey. So at the time I was really struggling with lots of different mental health situations. Um, I decided the way through was sorting myself out. Yeah. And uh, ironically, it's, you know, not for everyone. People approach the different things different ways. But one of my tools was trying to find really good books that helped explain how to essentially change your life. And obviously habits are part of changing one's life. Absolutely. I came across your book and I thought it was absolutely fantastic. So oh, when I heard that you. you wanted to come on Secret Leaders, I was really, really happy because uh, your, your work, it's nice for people to know this, your work genuinely had a big impact in my own personal development oh, that, journey and improved so my mental health say. massively. Oh, thank you so much. I have to say, wait, um, I've written three books now and, and there's a point at, in each one where you're like two years into writing the book and you're like, is anyone going to read this? Mm. Like, am I just wasting my time? So it's always like so gratifying to, mm. to hear from people who actually found something useful in it. Is so it, thank you. Is, is it, uh, is it difficult to wrestle as an author? Is it difficult to wrestle with the, I'm doing this for me because I'm interested and I want to do it. And, but I really would like to go on the New York times bestseller list. <laughs> it's actually, it's, it's less of a struggle than I, I, th I thought it would be because I think in general, when I write these books for myself, it's because I'm trying to solve a problem for myself. But oftentimes, it's a problem that I know other people have, right? So for The Power of Habit, the basic question was, if I'm so smart, why do I have such trouble getting getting myself to exercise in the morning or to eat more healthily? And for super communicators, it was, if, if, I'm, if I'm such a good communicator, I'm a professional journalist, why do I have such trouble connecting with people sometimes? And I think that these are things that are deeply human, right? That all of us struggle in different ways with these basic questions. Now, there's some, some things I struggle with that I don't think other people do struggle with. I can't think of any right now, but I'm sure that they're out there. But I think the things that I try and write about are, are understanding the systems in our lives and how those systems influence us and how we can take control of them in order to be better. And, and that's why science is so often at the core of this is because it's the scientific study of things like where habits come from, how we communicate with other people, how we connect with other people. And the science has real lessons and important lessons. So why do you personally care about communication? Oh what, my gosh. What brings you to this? I think communication is everything, right? You, you know, in the book, we tell the story of um, the Harvard study of adult development, right? Where researchers at Harvard have been following around thousands of people for almost 100 years, trying to figure out what helps people live longer and... Um, 
be happier and more successful, however you define success. And they found that basically the only indicator of how happy and healthy and successful you'll be at age 65 is having a handful of close relationships at age 45, which of course means you got them before 45. And the way that we develop those close relationships is through conversations, right? It's calling someone up. And conversations can be hard, right? If you haven't spoken to someone in a year and a half, you know it's going to be awkward for the first couple of minutes. Mm. But doing that, having that conversation, that is how we bring meaning to life. None of us, none of us can exist in a vacuum. And it's conversation that allows us to connect with other people in meaningful ways. There is a stat that I read. Have you ever read Lost Connections by Johan Hari? Yes, yeah. Yeah, it's a fantastic book. Yeah. Uh, and in that, he talks about, you know, the average number of friends an American male has over the age of 30 is zero. Yeah, which yeah. Which is just astounding. Yeah. It, but it's a, it perfectly explains your point, because that book is all on loneliness, depression, suicide, uh, you know, tragic stuff. Right. And being connected back to actually not having a social circle. Yeah. And and I think, I think everyone knows that feeling after you've had a great conversation, we feel wonderful, right? And in fact, our brains have evolved to feel wonderful after a great conversation. And if you think about it, communication is homo sapiens superpower, right? Communication is the thing that sets us apart from the other species. It's the thing that allowed us to build families and then villages and then towns and then countries. It's the thing that allows us to take a piece of knowledge and transmit it to someone else so that they don't have to learn that lesson themselves the hard way. And this, this is important. This is what determines who humans are. And at the core of it is this like wonderful mechanism of being able to talk to someone. And, and that we have that we have perfected this so much and we still make mistakes with it all the time, right? Just because, but the fact that we as a species manage to communicate with each other, that I can, I can experience a feeling and if I describe that feeling to you, you sort of, you experience a little bit of the same feeling yourself. That's amazing. Mm-hmm. Like, that's like mind melding. And it's worth talking a little bit about what happens in our brain when we're communicating. So right now in this conversation, even though we're not aware of it, and and this would be true even if we were talking over Zoom, our eyes have started dilating at the same rate. Our breath pattern has started matching each other. And if we could see inside our brains, what we would see is our neural activity is becoming more and more similar. And that actually makes a ton of sense. This is known within psychology or neurology as neural entrainment. And it makes sense because, as I mentioned, if I describe an emotion to you, you actually feel that emotion a little bit. If I tell you about an idea, you experience that idea a little bit. The act of our brains becoming similar is, in fact, the act of communication. And what's important about that is that it's not just the words that make that happen. It's establishing a connection, right? The fact that that if I'm talking about something emotional, just by reading the emotions on my face that you can empathize and you can you can understand that if if I'm if I'm talking about something practical and sort of you know making an argument that that even if you don't understand all the words I'm using which happens very frequently even if we speak the same language you can you can understand the thrust of what I'm trying to get across that's the important part of communication and so whether that happens through Google Translate or an email or a text or a face to face conversation as long as we connect with each other, we are communicating. So with the Harvard study, can you talk a little bit, little bit about the health benefits that yeah. we discovered? So the, um, the, the Surgeon General of the United States has said that being lonely is the equivalent of smoking 15 cigarettes a day. When, we're, when, we're, when we don't have deep connections with other people, almost regardless of how the rest of our life is going, we're just miserable. And as we're miserable, our health declines. So we're more prone to depression. Um, we're more prone to, to not making wise physical choices. We eat more and we drink more and we move less. And what's interesting is in this Harvard study, there was, um, there was a handful of people who were very, very successful professionally. They were some of the top doctors and top lawyers in the, in the world and, and who had invested in their careers instead of other people. And so they reached the age 65 and basically didn't have any close relationships. Oftentimes they um, they got married and then, then they got divorced and they have kids, but they talk to their kids once every six months, once a year. And you would think given their huge career success that these people would be very happy. And to a man or woman, they were miserable. All that they could see were all the negative things in their life. Humans are a social animal, right? We 
we've learned to experience life in social units. And when we don't have access to that social unit, there's a part of our brain that's starved. It's that same part of our brain that when you have a wonderful conversation feels terrific, feels amazing. That that part of our brain that craves connecting with another person. When we starve that part of our brain, it doesn't matter what else you have in your life or inside your head. It's really, really hard to be happy, mm. genuinely happy in a way that maintains for a long period of time. Mm. And how long did that Harvard study run for? Oh, it's still running. Oh, it's, really? it's almost 100 years now. Yeah, wow. it's been going on forever. Um, and they're still following people around as people. So it started with a, a, a group of Harvard students um, before World War II, and they followed them for a little while. And then they started following their kids and their wives, and then their kids' kids, and their wives' siblings' kids. And it got up to thousands of people, and they're still, they're still studying it. And what's interesting is the language around it has changed. So when they talk about the results now, what they talk about is they talk about companionship and connection. The companionship and connection are the most important things in someone's life. But back in the 1950s and 60s, the way that they described it is love. Right before love just meant something romantic. Before it meant before it meant um, you know, and had marriage overtones. Man's love for other for other men and women, our our love for our friends was was the was what was defined as as the thing that made all the difference. And I think there's something to that. Love means something different today. And it'd be weird to say you should go love as many people as you can and get people to love you. But we do know that when you meet someone and you sort of fall in love with them, it feels amazing. Mm. I am someone who runs a business. Our audience typically run businesses. Yeah. We all have to learn how to communicate. Absolutely. And one of the big challenges in any organization is not just two-way conversation, but free-flowing things get messy all over the place. Uh, the bigger you get, the harder communication is. How do we solve for this stuff? What does good communication look like in organizations? Yeah, what no, are some best practices? It's a great question. And and let me just say, if you are if you are the leader of an of a company, if you're a manager or the CEO, communication is your most important job, right? You you do not have the ability to like turn on all the machines yourself. You don't have the ability to produce all the widgets. Your job is to help other people do their job. And the way that you do that is you communicate with them. You, you help them have a common vision. You help them solve problems. So communication, a CEO's job is number one, communication. Now, let's think about like what this actually means. What does communication mean? Because some people hear that, and, and I was fell into the same camp. When I became a manager at the New York Times, I was at, I'd made a huge mistake. I figured that my job as a communicator, as a leader – was to tell other people what we should do, right? Like I think you should I think you should go work on this thing and I think you should work on that thing. But as we all know, anyone who's like worked for someone or been a manager, that's the worst way. That is not communication. Simply giving orders is not a dialogue. And so our job as a leader is not only to speak in a way that our employees can hear us, it's also to listen in a way that we can hear our employees and that they believe that we are listening to them. They, we are proving that we are listening to them because otherwise they'll just stop talking to us, right? They'll stop taking the time to try and explain how they see the world and we'll be in the dark. And so one of the best things that I think a CEO can do is two things. The first, and we know that super communicators, consistent super communicators do this. The first is ask more questions. And there's a certain kind of question that's a special kind of question that's known as a deep question. And a deep question asks us about our values or our beliefs or our experiences. And, and that can sound kind of overwhelming, right? Like ask a deep question. But it's actually much easier than it sounds. For instance, if you bump into someone who is a doctor, instead of saying, where do you practice medicine? What hospital do you work at? You could say, oh, what made you decide to go to medical school? Or what do you love about being a doctor? Right? When I ask those questions, what I'm doing is I'm inviting you to tell me something important about yourself, to reveal who you are. And so the first thing that we can do is we can ask these deep questions and listen closely to how people respond, because oftentimes they will tell us what they want out of this conversation, what they're seeking, what they need. And then the second thing we can do is when we ask that question and someone responds, we can prove to them that we've heard them. Because we all carry around in the back of our head this little suspicion, particularly if I'm talking to my boss, that you're not actually listening to me. You're just waiting your turn to speak, right? 
And so there's a technique called looping for understanding that they teach at business schools across the world that has three steps. The first is ask a question, preferably a deep question. The second step is repeat back what you heard in your own words. Show someone you heard them and that you're processing it. And then thirdly, ask if you got it right. And the reason why I think that's so powerful is because if I do that to you, if I repeat back what you said, if I show you, if I prove to you that I'm listening, it feels great. And it makes you more likely to listen to me. So these two things, asking more questions, particularly deep questions, proving that we're listening, because oftentimes even if we are listening, we still need to prove it. Those are things that study after study shows makes leaders much more effective. Okay. So asking deep questions, proving that we listened. Did I get that right? Yeah, you did. Well done. Well done. You're, you're so lo- meta. You're looping like a like a like a genius. <laughs> I was, I was quite worried for our conversation. I'm like reading the book. I was like, you I have a lot of pressure actually to, to do the interview properly. Otherwise, you just look like uh, you really haven't taken on board the. That's the true. And I should be asking you more questions. That's the. Uh... Hey, no, I'm, I'm here to, to milk you for your knowledge. Um, okay. Talk to me about the different kinds of communication yeah. that founders might find themselves. So, in. okay. Can I ask you a question for Please this? Do, yeah. So, um, I met your wife. She, yeah. She's delightful. Thank you. Um, I imagine you guys communicate pretty well. Yeah, I think so. When you don't communicate well, describe to me what's happening. Like what what what's what's something recently, not necessarily a fight, but just yeah, yeah. a place where you guys didn't link up. I think uh I, I can only speak for myself. I think when we're not communicating well, um, because I talked to you earlier, how, you know, I'm quite an emotional person. I can feel it. Yeah. I, I'm I I'm like I feel like the energy's off. Yeah. And so you're sort of speaking in shorter sentences um not checking in with the other person on how they're feeling right and you're mostly just focused on or i'm mostly just focused on getting my things done and avoiding contact with her yeah yeah Does and, that sound and, right or wrong no that and from her perspective how would she describe that so you it sounds like you're kind of ha- you're you're having an emotional conversation you're in an emotional place how would she describe where she's at you think in those exchanges I've never bothered to think about it. No, I'm <laughs> um, I I suppose I would say similar because my assumption was in itself is an interesting insight, right? My assumption is how I feel is how other people feel, right. whereas of course I know that not to be true. Yeah. Um, unheard. Yeah. Yeah. That'd be the simple answer. I think that's and I think that's a brilliant way of putting it. So I I had this same basic problem, which is, and and this is one of the reasons I wrote Super Communicators is. I got in, we fell into this pattern where I would come home from work after a long day and I would start complaining about my day, complaining about my boss and my coworkers. And my wife very practically would offer me some good advice. Like, why don't you take your boss out to lunch and you guys can get to know each other a little bit better. And instead of being able to hear what she was saying, I would get even more upset. And I would say like, no, you're supposed to be, why aren't you supporting me? You're supposed to be outraged on my behalf. What? And then she would get upset because I was attacking her for giving me good advice. And so I called up these experts and I said, look, what's going on here? Like, like we love each other. We've been together 20 years. Like, why are we having this weird fight? And they said, well, here's the mistake that you're making. We're living through the golden age of understanding communication, like never before because of advances in neural imaging and data collection. And they said, one of the biggest things that we've learned in the last decade is that we tend to think of a discussion as being about one thing right? We're talking about my day, or we're talking about our vacation plans, or what we're going to feed the kids. But actually, every discussion is made up of multiple kinds of conversations. And these different kinds of conversations, they tend to fall in one of three buckets. There are these practical conversations where I solve a problem, or I'm trying to make a plan, or I'm trying to discuss something logical. But then there's emotional conversations, And in an emotional conversation, I might tell you what I'm feeling, and I don't want you to solve my feelings. I want you to empathize. And then there's social conversations. And in a social conversation, we're talking about how we relate to each other and society and the social identities that are important to us. And they said all of these different kinds of conversations, they're all legitimate kinds. The thing is, if you're not having the same kind of conversation at the same moment, you can't really hear each other. Your brains can't become aligned. And so when you were coming home from work, you were having an emotional conversation and your wife was having a practical conversation. And so as a result, not only could you not hear each other, but you felt unheard exactly what you just said. You felt like this other person wasn't listening to you. And so the key is what's become known as the matching principle, that you have to start by figuring out what kind of conversation is occurring. 
And then you have to try to match each other. Either I match you or I invite you to match me. Because once we're aligned, once we're both having an emotional conversation, then we can move to a practical conversation, a social conversation, back to emotional conversation. We can move together in tandem. But unless we're aligned, it's very, very hard for us to really hear each other or to feel connected. That actually resonates. You know, recently, uh, last year, my wife and I were actually struggling with communication. Mm. Hadn't got your book yet. <laughs> so we had a conversation about, well, how should we resolve that? Like, what should yeah. we do? And it's like, well, why don't we, you know, both go and research things, ask some people. And in my research, I came across a book called Nonviolent Communication. Yeah. And so I made that suggestion. I was like, look, I, I read Nonviolent Communication. Um, would you like to read it? Like, or you can find something and I'll read that. But like, how about we just follow a principle? I don't think it necessarily matters what principle. Right. But let's get on the same page, which perfect metaphor because books. <laughs> but, you know, it was, and I think for her, knowing that I'd bothered at least yeah. to make a suggestion and practical. So I think that's always in a negotiation and a communication setting, if one of you is proactive about the thing, the other person can say, I'd rather do it this way or whatever, fine. But at least you have a starting point versus yeah. a complete blank page. So I suggested that and we followed that process and it really, really worked for us. Oh, and I, that's great to hear. I don't think it was necessarily all about being nonviolent communication. I think it was exactly what you just said, which was us aligning and getting on the same page. Yeah. Using the same language and the same principles for the purpose of that conversation and creating like a space where this is how we're going to communicate about that stuff, right? Well, and by you, by by recommending that book, by saying, here's a book I've, I've read, maybe you'd like to read it, or if you have one you want me to read, I think what you're doing is you're proving that you're listening to her, right? It could have been any number of books. It could have been any number of books that you had chosen. And yeah. and that- I've read Harry Potter, and I think- <laughs> <laughs> Harry Potter might be a, different, a difficult one, but- but the fact that you showed her that you want to connect is what's critical. Mm. And this is what we know about super communicators. So we're all super communicators at one time or another in our life, right? It, in fact, here's the best way to figure out who a super communicator is in your life. If you were having a bad day and you, you were going to call a friend who you just know would make you feel better, does the person you would call, do they pop into your brain right away? Yeah. Yeah, who is it? Uh, it's my friend Rob. Okay. So for you, Rob is a super communicator and you're probably a super communicator back for Rob. And so we all are at times super communicators. So sometimes we have that moment when we we walk into the meeting and we know exactly what to say to win everyone over to our side or a friend calls and we know exactly what to say. But there are some people who are consistent super communicators, who can, who can connect with almost anyone in any situation. And what we found about them is that they do these things like, for instance, they ask more questions 10 to 20 times as many questions as the average person. They prove that they're listening. But the most important thing that they do is they show you that they want to connect. Because in contemporary world, oftentimes we are we are worried. We're skeptical that someone wants to connect with us. We, we think maybe they're judging us. And when someone says, no, 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 I, I read this book and I really want to connect with you. If we read this book together, maybe we can find a new way to talk. It's that showing that we want to connect, the courage that it takes to, to make the first offer that oftentimes makes the, the connection real. And so one of the things that super communicators do is they show others that they want to connect. And I think you did it through a book and sometimes people do it through laughter or other means, but that's what, that's what makes all the difference. Okay, we're just going to take a break for a second. When we come back, Charles and I discuss the different types of conversations we could be having at any time and why it's important to make sure you're having the same conversation. We'll be right back. I'm going to level with you. I'm not the best manager in the world. I'm a decent coach, but management is my co-founder's thing, not mine. And thank God for that, because developing your team is one of the single most high leverage things you can do as a leader which is why I'm really happy we're working with Personio. They're the all-in-one HR platform you need to handle everything, from hiring to onboarding, handling absences to managing compensation. Their features touch every point of the employee lifecycle, from onboarding right through to exit interviews. And because they automate so much of the boring but necessary HR admin, you and your managers can focus on getting the best out of your people. So, if you're leading a growing business and want to spend less time on HR admin, then book a demo at personio.com forward slash secret leaders. That's personio.com slash secret leaders. 
There's a link in the show notes. So of famous CEOs, famous founders, who would you say is an exemplary super communicator? And counter to that, when I think immediately of two people, I think, you know, Elon Musk or Jeff Bezos, I don't necessarily think of super communicators, maybe, maybe Jeff Bezos, um, but not Elon Musk at all, right? And so oh, yeah. it's fascinating because he's probably the best CEO that's ever existed. What he did at Tesla is maybe even more amazing than what Steve Jobs that actually done at Apple. Uh, personal opinion, but whatever, it doesn't matter, right? As in, they're all incredible. Isn't that incredibly unusual that someone with his poor communication style would be so incredibly successful? Well, what's interesting, though, is that we see Elon Musk of today. The Elon Musk that built Tesla was actually a great communicator. In fact, if you go back, back before Tesla um, to the days of PayPal, right? So Elon Musk had started his own PayPal competitor named X. And then Peter Thiel had PayPal, and they merged them together. And they made, they made Elon Musk the CEO. And he did a terrible job communicating. He was just a terrible CEO, and they basically deposed him. And at that point, he could have taken his marbles and gone home or sort of been bitter. But instead, what he does is he sticks around and he says, I want to get better at communicating. And he works on it for years and years and years. And when you talk to people about him at Tesla, what he'll what they say is, yes, he pushed me. He was hard. But when I came to him with a problem, he could hear exactly what I was saying to him. I knew that he heard the problem. He wasn't blaming me for the problem if it was a real problem. Walter Isaacson, who just wrote the Musk book and is a good friend of mine, he said, Musk has this, this amazing ability to absorb so much information and more importantly, to show people that he's listening to them. Now, what's happened in the last couple of years since the takeover of Twitter is, I guess he's just decided he doesn't have to do it anymore, right? I think now he he would much rather just have monologues than dialogues. But I think you're right. I think if, if the Elon Musk of today was the Elon Musk of 10 years ago, Tesla wouldn't be what Tesla is. Now, the other question you asked, though, is who are great communicators? And and I think there's a lot and of them. And, and why? Yeah, like what do they do that makes them great? Yeah, so I think um, if I can go into politics, I think I think Barack Obama is an amazing communicator, right? I think that Barack Obama manages to hear what people are saying. He shows them that he hears what they're saying. He he makes you feel listened to. Um, I think... Can yeah. I ask a question? Yeah. Is there an argument to say as much as we'd hate it that Donald Trump's actually an incredible communicator? I think, I think that you can absolutely make that argument. Now, now the... What's important to note is that the reason why anyone can become a super communicator is because it's just a set of tools. It's just a set of skills that anyone can learn, right? If you learn these skills and tools, you can connect with people. And like any tool, it can be used for good or bad. An ax is a tool that I can use to build a house, or it's a tool I can use to cut someone's head off, right? And it's up to me, the person who's carrying that tool, to determine whether it's used for good or, or bad, and I think when you when you look at Donald Trump and you go to some of his rallies, what you see is he is listening really closely to those crowds. He is showing them that he's listening. He's saying, "I hear that you're angry, and this, and you're right to be angry." And I don't like what he's doing with it. I don't think it's healthy for the nation or the world. But yeah, he embodies a lot of the principles of good communication. That's why he has been successful, unfortunately. Yeah, and I guess the thing that's especially unique to him that increasingly you learn over time how unbelievably powerful his communication style is is he's the master of keeping things simple yes absolutely of keeping things simple of telling you telling you what you want to hear which means he has to be listening to you to know what you want to hear mm. right he's he is so invested in the conversation as opposed to the monologue again the, i'm not a trump fan but it is why he's been successful now, in the business world, I mean, what's interesting, you mentioned Steve Jobs. So there's this image of Steve Jobs as like, you know, the jerk, right? The, the guy who like, and I wrote a big series about Apple right after Jobs died. If you talk to people who work with Steve Jobs, what they will tell you is he was brusque, he was demanding, he had very high standards, and he listened better than anyone else. He would ask you question after question after question to make sure he understood what you were telling him. And then he would tell you what he thinks and he would ask you to repeat it back so that so that he knows that you understand him. Steve Jobs, being a great communicator doesn't mean you're, char you're charismatic or you're friendly or you're a good time Johnny. Being a great communicator means that you understand that the goal of a conversation 
is to understand what you are saying and to help you understand me. And that if we walk away from a conversation still disagreeing with each other, still thinking each other is wrong or an idiot, but if I understand what you are trying to tell me and I spoke in such a way that you can understand me, then that conversation has been a success. Mm -hmm. And that's what Steve Jobs understood, is that the goal of conversations at Apple was not to make people feel good. It was not to, to paper over differences or, or let people off the hook. The goal of the conversation was for others to understand what he was saying and to make sure he understood what they were saying. There's that famous quote in Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, which is, seek first to understand, then be understood. Yes. And I've always, always remembered that. It's so helpful in business and dealing with people to know that as so long as you demonstrate that you're authentically genuinely listening to that person and trying to understand their point of view they will eventually be open to let you have your turn that's exactly right and in fact we can't help but do that that's known as um, reciprocal vulnerability or reciprocal authenticity as our brains evolved to be so good at communication as communication became our superpower as a species we developed all these hardwired instincts. And one of those instincts is, if you show me that you're listening to me, then I have an instinct to listen to you, right? This reciprocation is at the core of the human instinct. And so you're exactly right. If you seek first to understand before being understood, what you're really doing is you're setting the other person up to listen to you. And that's really powerful. So one thing that I... I'm confused by. Yeah. Uh, on listening, I have been told that to be a CEO and truly listen to your colleague who comes to you with a problem, they might be expressing something emotionally. They might be expressing something emotionally in um, a vulnerable style. And their job is to tell you something. And my job as a CEO, as I've understood, is to not emotionlessly listen to them, but to uh, not try and be so much myself. The way that we've been communicating naturally over this, I've noticed, you know, I'm nodding and I'm getting emotionally excited when you're saying certain things. So are you, you're doing it right yeah. now. Um, and I've been taught that that's actually bad practice in those kind of conversations as a CEO, because what's going on is I'm essentially psychologically trying to encourage my colleague to mirror me and look for my cues of the parts of the things that I do agree with versus the parts that I disagree with and trying to influence essentially how they're talking to me. What's your view on that? Does that I, make sense? Do I don't think where that's right. That? I mean, I'll tell you what the science says. Yeah. The science says that you come into a conversation knowing what you want to to get across, and I come into a conversation knowing what I want to get across. We might not have we might not have elucidated it to ourselves, but we know why we're having a discussion. And and once we're aligned, then we can talk about our differences. But until we're aligned, it's very hard for us to hear each other. And so, what I would say in a situation like that is, when you're having that conversation reacting honestly and authentically is much more important than any other concern. Because if you're not being authentic, if I know that you're someone who who does nod, who does like participate, who does interrupt, right, which is an important part of conversations, if you're not doing that, then it, it's hard for me to feel like you're authentically in the conversation. So it's much more important than you know one tactic, should you nod your head, should you not nod your head, What's much more important is to try and make both people feel comfortable, make both people feel like they have the ability to say what they need to say. And so that might mean that that as you're saying something, and I agree with it, I smile. But it's equally important that if there's something you don't that I don't agree with is to look at you quizzically and to pay attention and say, like, I want to learn more about this. I want to understand how you see the world. So I think that we can we can spend a lot of time thinking about things that don't matter with communication. And underlying it is this basic principle that we should try and connect with each other first. And if we do that, then it solves a lot of problems. So coming back to the point on great CEOs and the different types of communication. Again, when we think of great CEOs, we think of the obvious ones. Steve, Steve Jobs is a perfect example. What was his major tool? Storytelling. Yeah. So how important is the art of storytelling as a theme within super communication? Oh, it's hugely important. I mean, it's just a hugely important in any kind of communication, in part because it's very hard for us to remember ideas unless it's embedded in the story. 
right? Hey, I'm sure you learned something in um, something really important in college, university, that at the time you thought this was so important that if I was to ask you about it today, you'd be like, well, I kind of remember studying that. I don't. But if I asked you to tell me the plot of Cinderella or Snow White, you would know exactly what happened, right? You would remember point by point what happened in those fairy tales. And it's because of that story, because stories are easier to remember. Now, I think what a good CEO does is that they help people understand that we can be the authors of our own stories. So in the book, one of the chapters is about Netflix, right? And Reed Hastings, the CEO. And, and they had this crisis within Netflix where one of their senior executives in a meeting used the N word. And, and this- to, to, be fair, to describe a show- To describe that, a show. That used the N word. That's exactly yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. That's exactly right. It. it wasn't it wasn't just apropos of nothing. Yeah. It wasn't it wasn't calling someone a racial slur, but it was to describe the the complaints they'd had about the show. Exactly. The yeah. Exactly. But he uses the full word. Yeah. And and a lot of people take offense at that. And he ends up getting fired. But inside the company, this sets off a civil war because it becomes essentially like a a a, a flame to to set off a fire that had been building for years. There's a bunch of people who say, look, what this demonstrates is that we have a problem with race at Netflix. And a lot of other people were saying, we don't have a problem with race. Like, you're calling me a racist. I'm not a racist. It's just that I'm better at my job than you are. So I get the promotion and you don't get the promotion. And so people start going at each other's throats. And Reed Hastings, the CEO of Netflix, he could have, he could have done what a lot of other companies done. He could have said, Let's shut down this conversation. Like as a communicator, what I want to do is stop us from talking about this. And, and you know, leave politics at home. We come to business to do work. But instead, he does exactly the opposite. What he sa- does is he says, we need to talk about this. We need to get this out in the open. We don't necessarily have to agree about everything, but we have to understand what each other is saying. And we have to be able to live and work alongside each other without this feeling that something that's important to me is being misunderstood. And so sometimes I think that the best communicators not only are good communicators themselves, but they're also people who create templates for communication, who create space for communication. And this is one of the things that we know about super communicators is that oftentimes if you look at a group, the person who's the super communicator, it's not obvious at first. They're not, they're not the most charismatic person. They're not the most bombastic person. In fact, if you have a really strong leader in a group, it actually tends to decrease the connectivity between people because everyone's pushed into their own corners. But it's the person who makes it easier for other people to speak up. The person who says, look, let's talk about something that's hard to talk about, but it's important to talk about, and I really want to hear from you. Sometimes the best communicators, particularly CEOs, are people who say, I don't have the answer but I want to create a space where everyone can bring their answers to the table and we can talk about them. Yeah, it's interesting. In that story, you have the example of the, the you know the lady that comes in to help solve the crisis, yeah. so to speak. And she sounds very much like a super communicator. Yes, yes, she's amazing. Can you share a little bit more about what she does? Yeah. You know, why is it? This is a really interesting example because obviously it's inside a business. Yeah. Um, and the the context, I suppose, that's important is Netflix's culture. So what's so confusing there is that they're not, uh, you know, they're a, they're a free-for-all culture in every single dimension. Absolutely. And so the idea that someone got fired for describing the show and a complaint from someone on the show was so completely bizarre at Netflix. Absolutely. Because the idea was kind of no one can get fired for anything as long as you're being courageous and doing the thing. That's exactly right. And they would encourage people to criticize each other and attack each other right. and to, they they believed that if you had a marketplace of ideas and everyone came to the marketplace with their with their razors ready, that that's how you get the best ideas. That's how, how you figure out what to do. So, so culturally what goes on inside an organization like that when something like this happens is essentially confusion. Yes. Because that, it's like, well, what are the rules? I thought this, these always were the rules. If that's not the rule, what are the rules? And when there aren't clearly established rules inside organizations, 
how could that be good communication? That's exactly right. And and in this case, it was even even more complicated because the executive who used the word, he apologized immediately. In fact, he had meetings where he explained how he sorry he was. To he reported himself to HR. And so when he was fired, it was bewildering to people. And that was the that was the hardest part about it is suddenly we don't that nobody knew what the rules were anymore. Like what's allowed and what's not allowed. And so as you mentioned, this woman, Verne Myers, is hired by Reed Hastings to come in. And what she says is she says, look, We've got to talk about this. We've got to have these conversations. But whereas for most conversations we have at Netflix, they can be free flowing, they can be unstructured, they can be us attacking each other's ideas and in and, and you know, radical honesty. For these conversations, we need to structure them a little bit because these conversations are are hard for people to have. And so what she did is she said there's a couple of rules that we're going to use in structuring these conversations. The first one is let's acknowledge that these conversations are going to be awkward. Like at the outset, conversations about race are hard conversations. And I might say something wrong. I might say something, phrase something in a way that's offensive to you without my my intending to, and you might say something wrong. And so let's just acknowledge it at the outset that this is going to be hard, this is going to be awkward, and I promise to forgive you if you say something that that's not exactly, you don't say it the right way. And I hope you I hope you promise to forgive me. And number two, what she said was, everybody has a legitimate seat at this table, right? One of the things that often happens with conversations about race, for instance, is that is that we default to feeling like someone who is a person of color has a right to speak and talk about their racial experience, and that someone who's white should just listen and not participate, but that's not actually a conversation. We're not connecting with each other if I'm just listening to you. And the truth of the matter is everyone has had a racial experience. Now, my racial experience is obviously very different from someone who's black or Indian or gay or non-binary. But we all have a seat at this table. You still have a human experience. You still have a human experience. And that sense of belonging is critical if we're going to connect with each other. And so they structured these conversations where they acknowledge that they're going to be hard and they acknowledge that people are going to say the wrong thing, but everyone belonged in that conversation. And that's how they resolved the issue. That's how they worked through it and came out a much stronger company as a result. All right, one more break. When we return, Charles shares his insights on the toughest part of being a leader, having those make or break conversations. From high stakes negotiations and gut-wrenching layoffs to rallying your team around a shared vision, the way you communicate can be the difference between success and failure. We'll be right back. Are you building a SaaS or venture-backed business? Or are you just trying to grow internationally? Well, if potential customers or investors haven't already asked you about ISO 27001, SOC 2, or GDPR compliance, they probably will soon. Achieving compliance can unlock major growth for your company, but the process is often time-intensive and costly. This is where our partner, Vanta, can help. Banter automates up to 90% of compliance work, getting you audit ready in weeks instead of months and saving you significant costs. Plus, Banter scales with your business, helping you successfully enter new markets, land bigger deals, and earn customers' trust. As a special offer, Secret Leaders listeners get 20% off Vanta when they go to vanta.com slash secret leaders. That's vant.com slash secret leaders for 20% off. There's a link in the description. What you've just described is a great example of how to have difficult conversations. Yeah. The hardest learning curve, probably, as a founder, as a CEO, as a manager, leader of any kind, is how to handle difficult conversations often. Yeah. And come out well. Like, and by well, I mean come out with the right outcome, which... You know, Adam Grant has an amazing framing for this, which is, you know, I'm giving you this difficult feedback because I have such high expectations of you and I know you can meet them. Yeah. Which is a lovely framing for it. Um, but, you know, these difficult conversations often go an emotional way as yeah. well. So how can we use super communication to handle difficult conversations at work? So it's a great question. And I think the first question that you should ask yourself is, do I want to have a conversation or do I want to just give someone news, let them process it, and then have a conversation, right? Oftentimes, if we come in and we say, you know, I'm going to have to cut your budget, or I'm going to have to demote you, 
we have this instinct to want to have a back and forth. But the truth of the matter is, when I get bad news, when I get some feedback that, that makes me unhappy, I might not be in the right place to have a conversation. And we don't have to have a conversation all the time, right? Sometimes I just want to tell you something and I want you to have some time to process it. When I say to my kids, you know, I want to have a conversation about your rooms, I don't actually want to have a conversation about their rooms. I want them to go clean their rooms. So the first thing to figure out is, are we going to have a conversation and how do we structure this conversation? Are we going to have it right away or am I going to give you a day or two to process what I've told you and then we sit down with each other? That's the first thing to do. The second thing to do in this difficult conversation is I want to, instead of telling you how I see you, I want to ask you questions, particularly deep questions about why you think this situation exists, right? So, you know, you haven't hit the sales goals that we set up this this year. And I'm in and I'm really disappointed that we haven't. Before we start talking about that, tell me tell me what it means to you. Like what does it mean to you that we haven't hit these sales goals? Why do you think we're having problems? Now the truth of the matter is someone might say, well, it's everyone else's fault. It's not my fault, right? And but that's valuable. Then I've heard something about how you see the world. But more likely, if I invite you to tell me how you see things, if I invite you to diagnose, you're actually going to tell me many of the same things I was about to tell you, right? You know what the problem is. And then, then if I prove to you that I'm listening, if I do that looping for understanding, if I, I repeat back what you heard in my own words, I ask your permission, I say, did I get that right? And I ask your permission to acknowledge that I've heard you, then we're in a position where you're much more likely to listen to me. And we can actually get aligned. And and the truth of the matter is, look, if I'm making you redundant, if I'm if I'm laying you off, maybe there maybe there isn't a need for a conversation. Mm. Right? Because because beyond sort of our emotional maintenance, it's not necessarily important. But if we are working together, if I want to give you this feedback because I expect that you will be able to succeed, I expect so much from you then what's critical is to get to a place where you genuinely understand what I'm trying to tell you. And I genuinely understand how you see the world. I genuinely understand how you're hearing it. That's how we become better. Laying people off is arguably the most difficult conversation oh, it's terrible. you can have at work. Is there a best practice or do you think it totally depends on that your understanding of that person's personality, character, uh, resilience, etc.? I mean, I think a lot of it has to do with the person themselves. But I will mm -hmm. say this. Oftentimes we, we, we treat that conversation as a practical conversation, right? I'm laying you off. Here's all the benefits. Here's your severance. Here's what you're going to want. Here's the logistics of leaving. But the truth of the matter is that the person who just got told that they're being fired they're having an emotional conversation, right? They, they don't care what the benefits package looks like. They're angry or they're sad or they're anxious or they're terrified. And so as a, as a CEO, as, a, as your manager, as a boss, the best thing that I can do if I do want to have a conversation with you, if I think we're in a place where we can actually talk to each other, or if it's a couple of days later and you've come to me and said, you want to, you want to follow up on this, is to match you. And if you are feeling emotional, to have that emotional conversation with you. Not to pretend like this is just a practical thing, this is just part of life, but rather to say, I hear you saying that you're hurt and you're sad and you're frustrated. And, and let me explain from my perspective why I felt like this was so necessary. It was because if we didn't have these layoffs, the company would have fallen apart and I'm terrified. I'm terrified of this company going bankrupt. Mm -hmm. That I think makes it, makes it easier. And, not every conversation is going to solve every problem. Not every conversation is going to, to make everyone walk away happy. But if we can at least hear each other and feel heard, then, then we feel better about the situation. We at least understand what happened. One of the most powerful ways that we can use communication and presumably super communication is through negotiation, yeah. right? So are there some good examples for how we can utilize those skills to oh, absolutely. get to yes, as people say? Absolutely. And it's really interesting that when we think of negotiation, what we tend to think of is we tend to think of two people fighting over something, right? And if I win a bigger slice of pie than you, then I'm a winner and you're a loser, or you're trying to win a bigger slice of pie. 
And what's happened in the last 20 years is that there's been this revolution in understanding how negotiations actually work, that there are these zero-sum negotiations. But in almost all of those situations, there's another option, which is rather than fighting over the size of the slice of the pie, can we somehow negotiate to make the pie bigger? Right? Can we somehow found, find new creative solutions that allow us to both walk away from this better than we were before? And, and what's interesting is that if you look at professional negotiators, if you look at you know whether it's foreign affairs or whether it's people working in industry, and you ask them, what's the secret to your negotiation? They don't say things like, oh, it's like you know my Jedi mind tricks. It's my ability to like box someone and force them into a corner. It's them saying, oh, I'm really creative. I'm an artist. I find solutions nobody thought of before. And not every problem has a solution like that, right? If you and I, if, if we're married and I want to have a child and you don't want to have a child, then it does not matter how, how much we negotiate with each other. We probably, we probably are going to have to walk away with disappointed. But if we do spend time trying to figure out how to make the pie bigger, then even if it doesn't work, even if we can't resolve the situation, we at least know that we tried everything. And it might very well be that there is a solution out there that neither of us are thinking about. When we think of a negotiation as a cooperative activity, as opposed to a combative activity, what we do is we take advantage of both of our intellect. I get to benefit from your smarts as a negotiation partner, and you get to benefit from me. And that that honestly usually leads to the right solution. Okay, so we've talked about hard conversations. Yeah. Oh, I just realized I'm naturally going to loop back to you. How, how natural. <laughs> See, you're so good. You're oh. you're a natural oh, super communicator. Uh, it's almost like I prepared for the interview or something. So we've, we've covered negotiations, hard conversations. I'd like to learn a little bit about how to motivate my team. Yeah. How to make them believe the kind of passion and vision that I've got and to really be heard. Yeah. Like to really feel like they're they're seriously on this mission with me. How do I do that? What okay, are my tools? so let me let me ask you a question hmm. to set this up. How do you get motivated? When you think back on about a boss you had or someone who helped motivate you, what did they do that made that got you motivated? Spent time with me. Mm-hmm. Um, it's actually a great question. It's been a long time since I worked for someone else, by the way. So I'm having to think back <laughs> over a decade. But and I had some terrible bosses. Yeah, which actually might be really helpful framing for because it's the opposite, right? Right. Um, but the good ones um, made me feel like an adult. Yeah, made me feel like I had agency over my choices. Uh, made me understand with clarity where we were trying to get to. It's essentially as simple as that. And. And were they able to do that? Because because everyone has different a, a different lock inside their brain, right? It's something that they need to unlock. If you think about those bad bosses you had versus the good ones, what did the bad bosses do that made them ineffective in that respect? Yeah. Um, very bossy. Yeah. Very direct. Uh, one of them was just the archetypal worst boss in the really? world you could ever ever have he would just put me down and um, would actually play psychological games with me and i was 21 so you know he would sort of build me up throughout the day and then absolutely tear me down in the same oh, day oh my god so you would go on like an emotional ride every single day yeah and go to work like dreading the emotional ride that you knew you were going to have um so i think he's unique because uh, i I've, I've never the stories I have of him, I've never met anyone else that has stories That's of such a bad boss. Um, so that one aside, um, but I also worked for another boss, you know, who did things. I worked in a sales office and he made us stand up all day until we made a sale. You weren't allowed to sit down. Oh my God. It's fine to make someone stand up all day in theory, if that's like a health thing or whatever, if that's your culture. But this was just about punishing you made a sale. So yeah. like visibly you all look like you're bad at your job until you see, you know, stuff like that. Right. Nuts. We, and, and from his perspective, he was probably like, this is a great way to motivate everyone. Because like, 100%. you feel the shame. It's motivating out of fear, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it's motivating out of fear. What I hear you saying, and tell me if you think I'm getting this wrong, is that the bad bosses 
actually did not engage in conversations with you. The bad bosses came and they basically monologued. They said like, this is the right way to motivate you. Make you stand up until you make a sale. This is the right way to, to, to motivate you is to play these psychological games. And every time you give them information about yourself, it feels like you're giving them something that they can weaponize against you, right? It feels like, it feels like you don't want to be open with them because you know that they're going to use it against you. Correct. Vulnerability was a weakness. There. Exactly. So the good managers, my guess is, and, and, and tell me if I'm getting this right, is that when they're asking you questions, what they're actually asking you is, what motivates you? Like, what, what do you like about this job? What do you care about in this job? And once I know, once I know, oh, I'm here because I want to earn a lot of money, or I'm here because I want to have a community, or I'm, I'm, I believe in the mission, or, or I like this job because it lets me get home and take care of my kids. Once I know what matters to you, then motivating you is really easy. Yeah. But if I don't listen to you, if I don't create a culture where you feel comfortable to share with me, to be vulnerable with me, to tell me what's going on inside your head, if you don't trust me, you're not going to tell me how to motivate you. And so by having these conversations, my guess is that what your boss was doing, and, and I'm curious if you think this is right, that what those good bosses were doing is they were just giving you what you asked for. Mm -hmm. And they were smart enough to know to know to ask you what you want. Is that fair? Does that seem right? Yeah, I think it sounds it resonates a lot. Um, but I also think, you know, looking back, I only really had one boss, one good boss. Yeah. Honestly, I had three horrific ones. <laughs> um, and some very average ones, but one good one. And that good one uh, just made me believe in myself. Yeah. It was really that simple, you know. He headhunted me from the bad place and told me I was great. And I was like, I can't be great. I've been told every day that I'm terrible. Yeah. And he's like, well, come work here. And I thought it was all a trap because, you know, you've had a few bad bosses. And so you feel like, actually, that's what work is meant to be like. And actually, this guy continued to tell me I was doing great. And how can we do even more great? And so yeah. after time, you start to believe in yourself, which starts to improve your performance exponentially, right? Yeah. No, absolutely. You believe that you're worth listening to. Yeah. This person is clearly listening to me. I must be worth listening mm. to. This person believes that I have the ability to get this job done. And I I admire them. I trust their judgment. And so I think I have the ability to get to do the job. It's really, really powerful. Mm. But the only way that we can do that is by communicating with each other, right? Right. I, I can't tell you, if I tell you how to do your job, if I just give you written instructions, you're not necessarily going to believe you can do it. It's me coming down and sitting with you and making a real connection and saying, I think you're doing a wonderful job. Like, I know that this is hard. I know that it's new, but I see that you can do this. Mm -hmm. That connection feels amazing. And we build so much of our self-worth on that. It's really powerful. So what do you think are like the, the pitfalls? So I guess to frame, I've just also finished, just before I read Super Communicators, I finished an old classic, The Psychopath Test. Oh, right. Yeah. Yeah. By John Ronson. Yeah. You ever read that? I love it. I You're love right. it. And really I, I love Ronson. He's yeah. just a wonderful it's person. It's really funny. Um, and so I read this afterwards. It was really great two books to read back yeah. to back because actually, you know, the other the thing is in, in the book and you learn you know, maybe 1% of all the world's leaders and CEOs are probably psychopaths and especially at the top, top level. And you read that book and you can totally see how. Yeah. But actually this would be their like absolute toolkit. Yes. To master their skills. Yeah. So I suppose it's a leading question. <laughs> what are the pitfalls? Are you just creating a, a toolkit to create more maniacs to enslave us all? No. Discuss. I, I think that anytime that we learn tools that are available to us, as I mentioned, you can use an ax to build a house or you can use an ax to cut someone's head off. Mm. What what matters Which is Which one not, are you choosing? Just I'm so choosing to build the house. The I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm okay. going to build the house, yeah. And and what matters here is, is not whether the tool is good or bad. It's whether you want to use it responsibly. And, and hopefully in Super Communicators, one of the things that we're teaching you is there are real values. There are real upsides to having these authentic conversations, to having real conversations, to not acting like a psychopath or like a narcissist, but rather if you want to be ha happy and successful and healthy, we should do the opposite. We should try and connect with people in honest ways. Mm -hmm. But I'll also say this other thing, which is 
our brains have evolved to be excellent at communication, right? This is this is our superpower as Homo sapiens. And as our brains have evolved, they've also just developed this hair trigger to detect inauthenticity. And this makes sense in the state of nature, right? Because on the on the plains of of you know wherever we came from, if someone comes to our village or our tribe and they're inauthentic, they pose a real risk. If we think they're a friend and they turn out to be an enemy, we need to be aware of that. And in fact, one of my favorite studies showing how good we are at detecting inauthenticity is that a bunch of researchers um, made tape recordings of friends laughing together, but then also strangers laughing together. And then they would bring in listeners and they would play them one second clips of the laughter, just one second. And with 90% accuracy, people could tell the difference between the friends and the strangers. We have something in our head that is so well-tuned that when someone is trying to use these tools, but they're using them to manipulate us or they're using them in a way that's inauthentic or they're using them in a way that, that they're not really listening, but they're just pretending they're listening, we can detect that, right? And you've had this experience. I've had everyone listening has had this experience that you're five minutes into a conversation and you're like, "Oh, this guy's a jerk." Like he asked me where I went to vac- on vacation because he wants to tell me all about his vacation, right? He, he's not really interested in me. And psychopaths, psychopaths can get away with it for a little bit. And if they're really, really talented, if they're really talented, I actually think what then they they'll do. They'll build Tesla. Yeah, then they'll build Tesla. <laughs> I actually think if they're really talented, what they do is they become genuine communicators. It's just not natural for them. But they recognize, like, if I'm going to succeed, I need to be able to really communicate with people. And so I think the key is we're better off knowing the tools. We're better off having the tools in our toolbox, particularly because these tools are tools that, if you use them wisely, make your life innumerably better. There's a story in your book about the NRA. Yeah. Um, now, obviously, anyone that understands even the most basic thing about America knows how divided the gun situation is. Yeah. And obviously, won't surprise you, um, the outside world just does not understand America. Not at um, all. Right. About that one thing. Yeah. Like, just do, it doesn't make any sense to anyone else outside of America at all. Um, but what we do know is it's a very complicated conversation to be had. It's sort of the uh, never-ending, unsolvable problem. Yeah. And so you had this really interesting story of how people behaved um, in person mm-hmm. and then on social media afterwards. Yeah. Right? There was a lot of ground made between the two groups who had completely opposing views on a topic that no one can ever get closer to. Um, and, and the reason I'm sort of summarizing the story is I'd love to know what you learned from that research, that study, that story, which people can find in the book if they want to you know, understand it more. Because it's a really great, really great story, really great chapter. Oh, thanks. Um, but the disappointment, the experience of the social media side. Yeah. How much harder is it to be a super communicator on social media? So, and so just for folks um, that haven't read the book, so you're exactly right. There was this experiment where they brought together people who are gun rights advocates and people who are gun control activists. And these are people who like normally scream at each other at protests, right? They, and they teach them this looping for understanding. They teach them to prove that they're listening to each other. And after two days, the groups say things like, this is some of the best conversations I've ever had. They didn't change each other's minds, but they felt like they connected. They felt like they understood the other side better. And people walked away saying, you know, we don't agree, but I want to keep in touch with you. I want to, I want to learn from you. I want to understand. And then they go home and they get on Facebook for a private Facebook group. And within 45 minutes, they're calling each other jackbooted Nazis, right? It all falls apart. Now, I think what happened there, and in fact, what studies show is that The breakdown was that they assumed that discussing online is the same thing as discussing something face-to-face. And what we know is that different channels of communication, they have different rules. One of my favorite examples of this is about 100 years ago, when telephones first became popular, there were all these studies saying, no one will ever be able to have a real conversation on a telephone, right? Because you can't see each other, no one will be able to really connect. And at the time, they were actually right. If you look at early transcripts of telephone conversations, what you see is people using them like telegrams, saying like, here's my grocery list order. I want to buy this stock. But by the time you and I and everyone listening were as a teenager, we could talk on the phone for seven hours a night. And they were real conversations. They were some of the most meaningful conversations of our teenage life. 
And the reason why they became real conversations is because we learned the rules of speaking on the telephone. And we learned that it's different from speaking face-to-face. Without recognizing it, when you speak on the telephone, you will inevitably overemphasize your words just a little bit. You'll put more emotion into your voice because you know that the person can't see you. And so you need to signal what you're feeling. We don't think about this at all. We're totally unaware of the fact that we do it, but we recognize that there are these special rules for speaking on the phone. Now, in the last, we, we've had telephones for over 100 years, right? Some forms of social media we've had for like five years now. These are such new forms of communication. And I have, a, I have a 12-year-old and a 15-year-old. When I see them online, speaking online, it's almost as if they speak a different language. Sometimes they'll send their friends just a list of emojis, and what they're doing is they're sending them an emotional an emotional communication, right? A smiling face and then a sad face. And they recognize that there are different rules for different forms of communication. They know that a Snapchat is different from a text, is different from sending emojis, is different from a phone conversation, is different from face-to-face. But we as adults, sometimes we're moving so fast and we're not paying attention to what's going on and we just want to get the... We sometimes forget that different forms of communication have different rules. And so when I'm writing... If I was talking to you and I said something sarcastic, you would hear the sarcasm in my voice. But when I'm typing to you, I hear the sarcasm in my head. But when you get the email, you don't realize I'm being sarcastic and you get upset. And if we take a second and before we we engage in digital communication, if we just say to ourselves for half a second, what's the rule that I need to follow here? How is this different from other forms of communication? Oftentimes all those problems get resolved. Okay, so I also, by the way, if you were receiving any form of communication as an American from an English person, you would just assume sarcasm, right? <laughs> just default, make it a lot easier for you. Um, so we talked a lot about the dialogue, the conversation, you know, back and forth with people. Sometimes when you're a founder, a leader, a CEO, a manager, you're speaking into a room. Sometimes it's an auditorium. and uh, And oftentimes it's actually a room designed to petrify you with investors who have all the power and all the money. So right. you put yourself into these different situations, um, but you're still on show and you're really, you're not asked necessarily to deliver a conversation, but a monologue, a speech, yeah. a one way message. How do you become a super communicator in those moments? So I think that people who are really good at this, if you look closely, maybe where when they're on that stage, it looks like a monologue but they're actually making it a conversation. Before they get on that stage, they're talking to people and they're saying, what matters to this group? What do you care about? What's the thing that I can talk about that's really meaningful to you? And they're paying attention while they're on the stage about how the crowd is reacting. This is what we see about good politicians. We think of politicians as getting up on a stage and just saying whatever the politician wants, but actually the best politicians, they change their speech as they're giving it based on how the crowd is reacting to them. They make it into a conversation. And and it's not as easy and it's not as perfect as being able to sit down face to face. But if I've spent a little bit of time trying to figure out what is going on in your head, if instead of just saying, oh, I'm going to write this boring speech and I'm going to tell you what my strategy is, if instead of thought about you, I try and have a conversation with you in my head, I know that I need to tell you a little bit of a story because you like stories and I need to make a little bit of a joke because it makes it easier to listen to. And I know that as soon as I announce this new strategy, you're going to be feeling anxious because I've talked to some of you and you already feel anxious and I'm going to respond to that anxiety. I'm going to talk about that anxiety. We tend to think of a speech as being just this one thing in and of itself, but it's just a moment in time. It's oftentimes a moment in a larger conversation that's taking place over many, many days or hours. And the best public speakers are the ones who make it feel like a conversation. And maybe you can't speak up right now. Maybe you can only talk to me in your head and I I need to wait until afterwards. But it feels like a conversation and that's what makes it feel so good. Mm -hmm. I I was about to ask you to do a wrap up, but I suppose what would only be correct is for me to loop back some. Absolutely, of the absolutely. So, um, we've talked a lot about uh, the art of negotiation, the art of storytelling, the art of having difficult conversations, and of course also being a, a super communicator 
where you need to motivate and inspire other people. Yeah. So these, to me, from what I've heard, seem to be the core pillars of how to be a super communicator at work anyway, in this kind of dynamic, in this kind of setting. Um, my, my question to you is, what do you want listeners to take away from? What is the key thing that you believe they need to understand to take one thing away to be a super communicator tomorrow? Here's the, here's the whole toolkit. Yeah. What's the simplicity? What's the simple answer? So I, um, let me just say for the record, that was a wonderful, I feel so listened to. You did a wonderful job of, of looping for understanding. I feel like we're married. It's <laughs> lovely. Thank you. <laughs> but I would say the number one thing, and then I'm curious, I, I, I might ask you a question if it's okay. Yep. The number one thing that I want people to carry away from this is to emphasize, we can all be super communicators. We can all... Super communicators aren't people who are super charismatic. They're not people who who are really outgoing or extroverts. There's no personality type that makes you a great communicator. Rather, super communicators are just people who, who think a little bit more about how to communicate and who show you that they want to connect with you. Because oftentimes... We all want to connect with each other. We, we go into a conversation and we're, we're dreading it or we're looking forward to it. And what we really want is we just want it to be fun and easy or satisfying. And what super communicators do is they signal to you, they show you that they want to listen to you, that they want to connect with you. And it's just a set of skills. It's not something that, that you have to have a special degree or a personality type in order to do. It's just a set of tools, looping for understanding, asking deep questions, showing you want to connect. If you grab onto those tools and you make them into habits, then you can connect with anyone. Okay, so here's my question for you, if it's okay. So you've been doing this show for a while. How have you changed as a communicator by virtue of doing this show? Hmm. I think the thing that is awesome about interviewing getting into a situation like this where there's a lot of pressure on you as the interviewer is you you do learn how to uh deeply listen Mm -hmm. and process information and figure out where you want to take the question because your curiosity starts starts to spike at various different things you'll be saying right so the the way that i think about this is um trying to hold space in my head for the various things that might be interesting whilst absolutely making sure that i'm definitely completely listening yeah because um it can be quite an unnatural thing to have this level of attention over such a long period of time often 60 90 minutes it's just not natural it's not the way that people typically communicate right? yeah it's just the reality uh so it takes a lot of headspace i think it is it's something that i constantly feel like i'm on a, a learning curve of discipline with that's interesting. Because it's it's not as simple as just listening. The perfect answer to give you is like, I've become an incredible listener. But it's not true, right? right? I, I think everyone's on a journey with listening. Some people are naturally amazing at it. I am naturally curious. So the problem that I have that I try to get better at is not interrupting, not asking the questions that I'm personally so fascinated by and trying to also hold some understanding of what the audience would be interested in, trying to pick up on your cues. What are the things you're more interested in? A good interview is more about the stuff, sort of 50% of the things that I'm interested in, 50% of the stuff yeah. that you're interested in, and maybe more so the stuff that you're really interested in, you're going to give better answers. So a lot of it's sort of just about paying attention. That's right. Really, what, what I hear you saying, and tell me if I'm getting this wrong, is that is that you spend a lot more time thinking about how the conversation ought to go. You think about the conversation as opposed to just have the conversation. Is that right? Yeah, annoyingly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and it's and you're right. It's it's a habit we learn, and it, and it can feel sometimes very meta, right? Like we're only in this setting, right? I don't do that outside of this setting, but right. in this setting, there's a lot of pressure, of yeah, course, to to make sure that it works really well. But the things that you pick up from interviewing in general is the ability to process a lot of information and try to distill and succinctly understand where you need to take that. Yes. And that, that's a really valuable skill just in any kind of I totally agree. Well, you do a marvelous job of it. That's very kind. Thank you. <laughs> so what I think I've heard is you're, you're approved. I totally and approve. you've enjoyed this interview. 100%. <laughs> okay. Charles, thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Really appreciate leaders. it. Thanks for having me. Awesome.